So it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. And I should add, I've read many of his books, and I've used them in my AP US history classes. So uh, Walter Licht is the Walter H. Annenberg Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his bachelor's degree from Harvard University, a master's in sociology from the University of Chicago, and a master's and PhD in history from Princeton University. He, he, you only missed Yale along the way there. And uh, Dr. Lick's expertise lies in the history of work and labor markets, and he teaches courses in American economic and labor history. His books include Working for the Railroad, The Organization of Work in the 19th Century, and that did win the Philip Taft Labor History Prize. He co-authored Work Sites, Industrial Philadelphia, 1890 to 1950, Temple University Press, 1986, and that's got some brilliant photographs in it, I should add. Uh, Getting Work, Philadelphia, 1840 to 1950, Harvard University Press, 1992. Industrializing America, the 19th century, Johns Hopkins Press. So the schools you didn't get to study at, you managed to use their presses, that's good. And The Face of Decline, the Pennsylvania Anthracite Region in the 20th century, Cornell University Press, uh, which was also the recipient of the Merle Curdy Prize of the OAH for Best Book Published in American Social History and the Philip S. Klein Prize of the Pennsylvania Historical Association. Professor Lick began teaching at Penn in 1977. Uh, he's received the Ira Abrams Memorial Prize for Distinguished Teaching, uh, awarded by the School of Arts and Sciences at Penn, uh, and many other grants and fellowships, far too numerous for me to elaborate right now. He has served as the graduate chair, the undergraduate chair of the Department of History Chair, associate dean in the School of Arts and Sciences, um, he's currently the faculty director of Civic House and the Penn Civic Scholars Program, and he's working currently on the book American Capitalism's A Global History, which we should be looking for in 2014. Maybe. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Lick. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I have to tell you, it's a pleasure being here. I am a former public school teacher, so I've been in the classroom. Uh, I've maintained, as at least one of our uh, your members here knows, a, a relationship with West, uh, Philadelphia teachers. I've taught in many teacher institutes over the years and worked very closely with teachers in the social studies and history teachers. I'd have to say in all my work with teachers in these kinds of presentations, I've never drawn an 8.30 Sunday gig time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I hope you have risen and shining. Uh, but it's great to be here. I am circulating something, and I've been told I cannot leave this triangle here, but I'm going to have to ask it come up soon. A, a, rather than a virtual visual aid, I have a visual aid. And at some point, well, I probably could use it right now. And then I'll bring it, uh, give it back here. So I have brought something, uh, which is a prized possession of mine. Uh, I don't want to say anything about it yet. Everybody knows what it is. But some of you have seen it, and I'm just curious ab uh, about what you think about it. And if you play the game of archaeologist, and you happen to have dug this up in 200 years, let's say, what would you make of the civilization uh, and, and imagine about that civilization from this artifact? So uh, any impressions here? Thank you. Loud, I guess. Large. Uh, OK. This, by the way, speaks very directly to what I'm about to do with you uh, in talking about how Philadelphia became a manufacturing center. Start. <laughs> oh, yes, you need it. Well, it's obviously a commemorative item, so it's not, while it is Why do you say it's commemorative? The inscriptions. Every saw made by this outfit had that inscription, so it's is not that? commemorative at all. It, it looks... I mean, the, the decoration, the, you know, the decorative It's items, not commemorative. It's uh, this company, every saw had this emblem. This is a saw, by the way, made in 1920, and, and the, 1921. And uh, the quote? They all had the quote, too? Yes. Okay. So it's not commemorative. So, this is a working saw. They're obviously proud of their... Yes, I'm proud of it, too. There's Go on eBay and try to buy this. <laughs> In the back, I'm sorry. It appears that there's a union bug on it. Um, that, that symbol looks like it could be made by a union, wor union workers. 
Well, uh, you're right. There was a very strong skilled workers union attached to this firm, but that is, that's the firm's insignia. I think the fact that the handle it has ornamentation on it just says something about you know, work and beauty and yes. you know, that kind of a combination. This is a work of craft. By the way, this is mahogany imported from the Philippines and made in this factory deliberately by very skilled uh, woodworkers. And I don't know if you noticed the bolts. Those are brass bolts made in the brass bolt foundry of this operation as well. One last comment, and I'll tell you a little about it. Uh, uh, craftsmen still use that saw after... Uh that same saw, that same type of saw. I have, uh, I have a carpenter in my house whose great, 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 great grandfather had a, I'll give it away, a distant saw from the 19, 1870s, which he still uses. One last one, and uh, those who didn't get it, we'll pass it around again. I, when I was a little girl, I had a great aunt Lee, and she played a saw like that. <laughs> yes, I'm not going to do that. I didn't bring my bow in. I have to say, once I was doing this, and someone did come up with a bow and started playing it. I didn't even know they were going there. And I was supposed to give a lecture, and I said to them, I didn't believe I was going to become second fiddle <laughs> at this presentation. So let me tell you a little about the saw, and this is very apropos of what I'm about to say. Um, and I will have it available for those who have not been able to touch it. Uh, this is a saw that comes from a uh, large industrial uh, plant here and a firm which is not lo any longer in existence, the Henry Distant Saw Firm. Little do we know about Henry Distant. He was British. Uh, he arrived as a uh, teenager, probably about 13 or 14 years old, around 1833. Uh, and immediately on his arrival, as actually his father died, uh, he apprenticed himself, as was the way back then, to two Englishmen who had recently arrived as well. And whether the family knew about these people, we don't know. But these were two Englishmen who had, uh, had a successful careers as first apprentices and journeymen in saw and file making firms in Sheffield, England. And in Sheffield, England, they had developed a specialty kind of steel, which was wonderful for tools, which had extraordinary strength, but also tensile strength. And he apprenticed with these two saw makers. And within about 10 years, uh, he went out on his own uh, in a small factory, not too far from where we are, by the way, about 10 blocks away from where we are, and was highly successful. In fact, by the 1851, when the British had this great exposition of industrial wares, the great uh, uh, Glass Palace exhibit, Distant Saw won the top prize for international prize for saws. And he's in his tw uh, maybe 30 at this point. Uh, he out, that firm outgrows its place in downtown Philadelphia, which is filling up, and he creates a factory complex at the very northeast tip of the city, in where we call, I call it Taconi, but the locals call it Tacony. <laughs> uh, and there was the great distance saw works. Uh, how great? By 1920, 75% of all saws in the United States were coming out of that factory. These were made with the highest craft skills the highest craft skills, and with a great appreciation for <clears throat> the beauty of such an implement, with the kind of orma ornamentation, the use of mahogany uh, handles, the brass bolts, uh, but also the use of uh, still this very specialty steel uh, that these immigrants from Sheffield, and by the way, he kept recruiting other immigrant workers from Sheffield to come to the plant who had, pr had apprenticeships and journeymanships over in England. And they brought both the knowledge and the expertise of this and continued to make what was considered the greatest saw in the world, always winning international prizes. And it does so, so because it has extraordinary strength. Talk to a carpenter, it is almost impossible to break these things. But it also has a great tensile strength and never, ever warps. Ever. The other thing that it has is that these are all hand-notched and hand-sharpened uh, notches in the, in the saw blade, and they never lose their sharpness. Mm -hmm. And if you meet old carpenters, they are using distance for saw, saws made in the 1880s, the 1890s, never warped, never, 
lost their sharpness. And, they, and now they, they are uh, 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 collector's items. You can go on eBay and try to buy these things. Um, I'll have one more thing to say, and then I want to get back to it, because embedded in my story is the, uh, the story of Philadelphia manufacture, and that is um, the manufacture of high-quality specialty goods here. This was not a city that, with very few, with there some a couple of exceptions, where there was mass production of standardized goods. This was a city where there was a premium on skill and a premium on craft, and you made these terrific kinds of wares and products to be sold. Uh, I'll, I'll just go very fast. Starting in the 1920s, this firm began to fail. And one of the reasons it began to fail is that we were beginning to get mass producers of, you'll excuse the expression, schlock, uh, of cheap kinds of products. And the leader was the mass distributor, Sears Roebuck, uh, who decided to create a division. We all know of it. It's called Craftsman Tools. And they began out in large factories in Indiana and other places, beginning to mass produce a saw that never saw a hand touch it. Uh, they would use cheap galvanized steel. Uh, it was all machine cut and stamped. Uh, first pine, then plastic, when plastic comes around. And we now know from research in the Sears archives that those saws were meant uh, to warp within three years uh, and uh, certainly lose their sharpness within five years. And you began to get a kind of production of planned obsolescence where they were selling a saw which was one-tenth the price of the distant saw, but disposable. Uh, the distant store people, with their skilled workers, knew about this, but they either didn't know how to react to it or didn't choose to react to it. And eventually, this cheaper item, mass-produced and mass-sold in the Sears Roebuck distribution system, uh, began to out outsell the distant saw, which at one point, 75% of all saws in Amer America came from this plant. And we all know about deindustrialization today and the loss of manufacturing. I'll end with that. And we all think about, you know, the sort of the flight out of the old industrial areas to places in the world where they have lower cost, lower labor cost. That's not what did in distance saw. And that's what did not do in the great manufacturing system of Philadelphia. But rather, in starting in the 1920s, a change in consumerism and a change in consumer preferences to cheaper disposable goods. And one by one, the great custom manufacturers of Philadelphia <coughs> either did not know how to react to it or did not choose to react to this, and they closed their doors. So this is not a story of capital flight. It actually isn't a story of high wages in capital flight because all of these firms required highly skilled workers. Uh, actually, many of them recognized and worked with the craft unions that were involved and paid very, very good wages. Um, it was just that they, many generations later, those in the family, as somewhat traditionalists but not willing uh, to go to a cheaper kind of production system with a crappier good that, uh, from what they honored to produce. So I'm going to get to the deindustrialization story, but it's not the deindustrialization story that many of you walk around with. This is a story about a, a shift in compu commu uh, consumer tastes and compu uh, commuter preferences and the coming of certain mass production, uh, mass distribution the Walmarts of our age, <laughs> uh, the Sears Roebuck, and the impact that those mass distributors had on the manufacturing sector. And it's still happening. To, you know, the Walmarts are doing the same thing today, but on an international perspective. I'll take one question, and then we should move on. Wait for the microphone. Wait for the microphone. And for those who have not touched this at the end, please do, because it's a remarkable. I'm, I'm curious, what <laughs> did it last sell at before? It the price, went, I don't know, don't but it know. was about one, uh, tw 10 times okay. the price of and a Sears And what connection Robux. does the new industry of advertising have on all of this? Tremendously, because you don't have, you know, Sears Roebuck is, 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 uh, is uh, you know, your pioneer, not just in mass production, but the kind of mass advertising through that catalog that winds up in, you know, we now have the catalog on the web, but basically they are the great pioneers in putting a catalog of an emporia, you're very hands, you know, into the mail. And so it is a combination of a, a mass advertising, mass production system, but showing you a cheaper good, a standardized kind of cheaper good. And that required a change in taste for most Americans rather than why buy an object. 
like a, in, the great firm in this a Stetson hat, which lasts a lifetime and you pass on down the generations, uh, you, you, there are places out there that are going to produce a cheaper hat. And we get used to a, a society of disposable goods. They're selling between 40 and $50 on eBay right now. <laughs> Uh, one last question, and then I've got my presentation. The the uh, the cheaper product, but how did when did uh, the uh, Craftsman guaranteed for life come into effect? Where they oh, guaranteed in a, in a plant like Distin, Distin, not only did he uh, uh, create a, a phenomenal factory complex, but he actually created with it a company town. So you can go up to uh, to Coney and surrounding the vestiges of the old factory, most of it is rusting away, you'll see the company town that he built. And it, he, he, this was a family. He, and he recruited these journeymen and apprentices from, uh, from Sheffield, and he created a whole family. There were school stores, the whole works there. And so uh, not only were there expectations that this was a life, you had a life within this firm and the benefits of being part of this community, but the family itself, uh, until it sold out in the 1950s, also had a sense that uh, uh, we will watch over our people here. And they had to. There was a premium on skill here. They had to respect that. So the workers were not going to be disposable either. So let me say a little about uh, how Philadelphia became a manufacturing center. But I want to give you a bit of a primer first on industrialization uh, really quickly. Uh, some of you may be aware of it if you kind of read the latest stuff, but the way industrialization is thought of by historians, is taught by historians, has changed remarkably uh, since I was in graduate school in the 1970s. I've been sort of part of the shifting way of thinking about industrialization. And like other things in history study, basically what we're doing is complicating what once was a kind of easy, well, not so easy, but a, a kind of simple kind of textbook story. Uh, so I want to give you some inklings of this, but I'm going to do it pretty fast as this kind of primer here. And let me get to the next slide. So I have industrialization complicating the history, and I'm going to go through this really quick. I just want to say from the very beginning, we're very aware of those who you know, have spent their scholarly careers uh, researching on industrialization, that we got a problem with the term itself. Uh, if you pick up books like my own called Industrializing America or, or other books on that order, uh, you will see very specific definitions uh, by different authors. Um, and show me a definition of an author, and I'll tell you where to start the story. Because uh, uh, it's really connected, the definition, to where they start. And some people start this as early as the 1600s, some tell the 1700s. And, I, and some, it's a 19th century story. You can tell purely from what they take to be the definition. So uh, I just did a quickie through some of the better books on industrialization today. And you can see someone in the first sentence says, industrialization is about that era in history where we had a great growth in manufacture. Others would say, no, no, it's the advent of the factory system. That's a 19th century story. The growth of manufacture actually is a probably an 18th century story. Um, the history of, tech, uh, history of technology people, and I kind of like it, but it's a mouthful. Uh, we'll say industrialization is that point in human history when we get the rapid, and I think rapid is the key word here, rapid adoption of a mechanical means of production and inanimate forms of energy. That is a mouthful. Uh, and it's, it, it's taking both the, the sort of mechanical means of production where you're, separate, you're uh, substituting capital means of production for labor, uh, but also this coming on of new energy sources. And what do I mean by inanimate? forms of energy. Non-human, non-animal. Correct. Not muscle. Either the muscle of beasts of burden or the muscle of humans. Uh, and you know, you have water power, and then you get the uses of various fossil fuels. Uh, so the history of technology people have very, very important. They, they got their starting dates for this story. And finally, uh, and this tends to be actually somewhat within the Marxist traditions, uh, that they will say, when do you get the start of industrialization? When do you get the spread of the wage labor system. So uh, I, you can see various different starting dates from historians if you pick up a book on uh, history of industrialization. And it usually has to do with what they take to be the prime definition. I'm pretty e eclectic about this. I think it's, uh, it's very hard to filter out any one of these uh, characteristics here. But I will leave you that that's 
We've complicated this notion of what we take even to be industrialization, okay? Finally, uh, not finally, secondly, uh, there's hardly a historian today who deals with the history of the growth of manufacture, advent of the factory system, et cetera, et cetera, who uses the term the Industrial Revolution. It's just not a term used anymore. And the leadership actually came from the British historians, uh, you know, who really, that's where the genesis of all this begins. And this rare, uh, you will not see any, a British historian use that term, the Industrial Revolution. And for the following reasons, I mean, it's a little more complicated than what I'm about to say, but I'd say in the recent studies of industrialization, um, what has been primary, the primary finding, the primary, primary thematic, and, and this is the word you'll see constantly, is the unevenness of this development, the unevenness of this development. That this, the, uh, the nature of industrialization, the pace of this, and again, depending on what you want to say it is, uh, varies enormously. It varies uh, enormously in different sectors of the, uh, uh, of the economy. It certainly uh, uh, varies enormously regionally, geographically. And they are struck by the very unevenness of this. It's not uh, a story where one day everybody's farming and the next day everybody's walking into factories. It's not that kind of tale. Uh, it's a very slow evolutionary process unfolding in different trades in different places at very different paces in very different ways. So we tend to think of this as, uh, as we use the term industrialization. We do not use the term industrial revolution anymore. Uh, and I'll have a little more to say about that as well. The final uh, thing I want to say in its primer, this sort of fast primer on industrialization, is that there has really been a shift uh, in a sense of where, where, are we, where will we first start this story. And again, that varies by which historian you're reading. Um, but some, but a, a shift in the stories that have been told, and the stories most of us have told in the classroom, uh, and particularly in the high school classroom. Uh, maybe you've shifted already, but I remember from when I was teaching, uh, there was this kind of story. Um, and it usually began uh, with an invention. What was it? Steam. Well, I heard it. What did you say? Well, that's the American story, the cotton gin. That's a bad story also, by the way. <laughs> and I'll come back and come back to that. But I heard the steam engine. I, I mean, I grew up in my high school history book, and when I taught it was hand, uh, social studies, I was handed a history book where, um, you know, uh, and I have this sort of, um, you know, whoops. I have this, uh, let's see if this thing works. Does it? Yeah. Where, you know, human history from the Garden of Eden <laughs> uh, was going along, and then all of a sudden there's some shift the, called the Industrial Revolution. Um, and normally we attach it to this thing, the steam engine. By the way, that's what early steam engines looked like. You think of a little steam engine on a locomotive. These were, these were big things. Uh, usually the story goes like this. It's actually usually attached to somebody's name. James Watt, who's on, you know, what's on first and who's on first, but uh, James Watt. Bad stories. All sorts of bad stories. First of all, the great leap forward. First of all, lots of people were inventing the steam engine. There are many, many patents on the steam engine. I, I think that Watt goes down as the best advertiser and hustler of his steam engine. Yeah. You know, that's why he gets himself into the history books, basically. Uh, you really want a great guy who did it. It's Thomas Newcomen, who 30 years earlier really had mastered the whole principles and understood the physics of the steam engine. But the steam engine is really not a great story about industrialization here. It's a great story, but it's not connected to manufacture at all and will not be connected to manufacture at all for a good 100 years after its invention. What is the story of the steam engine connected to? Mining. Mining. But it's actually connected to something else. It's actually, and you want to call it, it's, it's connected to extraordinary shifts in agricultural production in the, the Great Britain, where they went from, uh, and very slowly, and again, this happened unevenly, from the old kind of feudal arrangement, land arrangements of ownership and land working, to large open field commercialized agriculture. And in the process of going to large scale mechanized agriculture, what did they destroy? 
Well, they, well, and what was part of the commons? Everybody had access to this part of the commons. <laughs> what do you got to mow down if you're going to go to a large-scale open field? The forests. This is one of the great ecological interventions of humankind in Great Britain in the 1600s. They just destroy the forest lands of England uh, as they go and break up the old kind of feudal arrangements, land owning and land working arrangements. They go to the open fields. And they basically destroy the woodlands of Great Britain. Uh, not only have they destroyed just that nature, but they've also destroyed the most important source of heat. And uh, that then, with the absence uh, of, of wood, they, they begin to think you need another source. And there are outcroppings of coal all over the place, but particularly in certain districts of England, they start using those at, outcroppings of coal to heat homes uh, and run out of those outcroppings. And now they have to start digging and mining coal, whether it's in, in Wales, Northumberland, wherever. And the minute they go below 100 feet, what do they hit? Water. They hit underground water streams, and they've got a. Pump. They can't. These kind of hand foot driven pumps are not going to work to get all that water out of there. And that's where there's this flurry of activity to try to have a mechanized means of pumping this water. And there are some scientific breakthroughs in the understanding of uh, vacuums and hydraulic power, the use of vacuums, where you begin to have people experimenting, Newcomen being really, I think, the, the, the great experimenter here in a steam engine. Uh, by about the 1830s, when Watt really comes along, the thing has been perfected. And he's got a great steam engine. There's no doubt about it. But uh, his, his work is really in running a business and hustling that steam engine. And he goes back down into the history books for that. That device, which is extraordinary. I don't want to take the story. You know, It is an extraordinary device. has nothing to do for manufacture for a long, long time, a long, long time. Uh, that device will not be put on a wagon, for instance, for a long, long time to make <laughs> something you want to call a locomotive, at least 100, more than 100 years after its invention and perfection. So there's a kind of disjuncture between invention and application in this case, which is a story you do see in the history of technology quite often. Um, it will be put on a boat, as you all know, you know, in the first decade of the, of the 19th century to have a steamboat. But in terms of it harnessing a machinery in a factory, we will not see uh, in England or, or the United States the first application of a steam engine to run machinery in a factory until the 1850s. And it's not done very well. It will not be perfected really to the 1870s and 80s. So there's almost a 150-year lag between invention and application into manufacture. So the story of the steam engine is not a story of industrialization. It will eventually will be, replacing water power. But uh, that's late. Uh, the real thing is, and if, uh, if I had to use the word revolution, I'd, I'd certainly use it for what's, uh, what's depicted here, and that is the textile revolution. I don't like using the word industrial revolution. I use industrialization. But I have to call this a textile revolution, because it is remarkable in about a 30, 40 year period, the amount of technological uh, and, uh, uh, development, which also leads to a whole different way of production and a different place of production, comes out of the home into the factory. So it's a textile revolution for me. And I'd say most historians of, uh, of industrialization say that. I'll say very briefly about this, because this sh we've had a shifting story here, which has made it more global. Uh, the normal story you have about here is that the, um, the British now have colonies. And with their mercantile system, uh, they want to sell products into the, the colonial world. Uh, and they, they, have, they can uh, produce bolts of cloth uh, uh, to sell in their colonies and, and get whatever the resources of the colonies will send into the manufacturing system of the home countries. And usually the story is this production of cloth is happening in the home uh, on the, so the putting out system. There had always been home production of textiles and home production with a cloth produced clothing. But now we're, we, we want to have increased production. And we reor the merchant community begins to reorient these cottagers out there who are, have been displaced somewhat from the upheavals in the, uh, in the organization of agriculture and are there 
as a surplus labor force to be used for the production of cloth. I think you know this story of outputting, where it, within the house, the merchant shows up to a household, uh, usually sometimes with even the tools of production and the, res the raw materials of production, and reaches some agreement with the family head, the patriarch, that he'll return in two weeks and walk away with two bolts of cloth or something, and in return for whatever goodies the merchant can give that family. Um, and we do have a ex vast expansion of home production here. And we have that sort of gendered and generational division of labor where the young males will help the, fa uh, the, uh, fa uh, the father figure usually prepare the r raw material that's going to be spun and woven, whether it's flax at this point, it isn't cotton, or wool. It won't be cotton until the 19th century. Uh, the, usually the women do the spinning, and then the men do the weaving. Uh, and there are all sorts of arrangements. So we know that putting out system is there, and we know there are lots of log jams in that system, uh, particularly as there's a lot of pressure to produce more and more because there's this world market for the textiles coming out of England. And the great log jam, as you know, you probably know the story, is in spinning because you have you know, someone sitting in a simple spinning wheel with one bobbin being wound and the weavers waiting for you know, all of the, the spun thread. And that's where a, the first log jam is. And that's where we get the first kinds of experimentation with the spinning jenny and then the spinning mule. Uh, and this is basically in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, where we get the great leap throughs technologically in the spinning wheel, where uh, instead of one of a foot-driven machine, which in one bobbin is being wound with this thread that's being twisted, uh, you, be, you begin to have many twists going on, many fibers being twisted at the same time, and you're up to about 240 uh, bobbins taking the, the, the twisted thread at some point, at, by the point you get to the spinning mule. Um, and this happens in some very important craft shops in England. Um, once, by, uh, now, once these machines, of course, get huge, you've got the problem that they cannot be driven by foot power as the old spinning wheel can, and <laughs> they're taking up much more room than the cottage. And that's where the Great Revolution is, where you begin to take this machinery out of the home, and that great disassociation of work from the home begins with the advent of the factory system. And where do you take them? Well, they have been harnessing water power for ages, in grain mills and sawmills, and those first implements are taken out of the, into these grain mills and the sawmills. And there's a wonderful anomaly of words here because they become called spinning mills. One of the anomalies of the use of words is a mill is about grinding. You know, you're grinding grain or you're, you're, you're sawing something. There's, not, there's nothing, there's no milling going on in a spinning mill, but they use the term mill which has, and these places have nothing to do with milling. So there's a kind of an anomaly of the use of words, but we get the spinning mill. And then you begin to get the, the, up, the up ending of the old family system of labor where the, uh, the females uh, will, and particularly the older daughters, will go, rather than working in the home, they'll go out working into the mills and you get the mill girls. That is a story I've just said in about a minute and a half, which brings a longer time. Uh, and then one last thing, and I'll take a question. By the, after you've solved the problematic of spinning, because that's the real log jam, and you, you have to add to the productivity of spinning with this use of cap, uh, capital good rather than hand labor, uh, now we've got an abundance of the, of, the, of the fibers, the twisted fibers. And again, this is initially wool and flax. Later will become cotton. Uh, the next log jam is that this, there's too much of this spin thread for a single weaver, handloom weaver, to absorb, and you will be beginning to get automated technologies in weaving. By the way, there's a lot of spin outs here because once you get a lot of cloth, the old ways of bleaching, whitening the cloth, putting it out in the sun becomes unrealistic because you have so much cloth, there's not, there's not enough ground to cover. There are inventions of bleaches at this point, and that gives birth to the chemical industry. Uh, once you have all that cloth, you can't use the old uh, natural dyes. You're going to have to have synthetic dyes, and that gives birth to the chemistry industry. So what's remarkable to me about the textile story is, is revolutionary, not in the kind of technological 
leaps forward in 30 or 40 years very, very quickly. But all the spin-offs, it gives birth to the chemi chemical industry because of the initial having to develop of bleaches and dyes. It gives birth to the machine trades. It also gives birth to the iron and steel industry because these, once these implements are being harnessed, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> by fast flowing waters, uh, the wood ones are just going to break up. So you're going to have to create these machines out of wrought iron first and then steel. So if you ever want a revolution, it's a textile revolution. What it gives birth to, the pace at which it happens, the way it upends old systems of the organization of labor, separating work, out, taking work out of the home into a factory system, it's a textile revolution. A question. I was wondering when you were talking about how big they were getting, if the, the bigger than the cottage. Okay, yes. <laughs> I was wondering about the machines itself. Did the move to the factory? Did that happen because um, the people themselves were creating the the machines were getting bigger, or did the factories get big so we could have big? Did the fact were the factories being well, it's built a little so of both. that we could get the machines? It, no, no, That's no. That's what I was Initially, wondering. basically, it's uh, a little seat of the pants going on here. You've got a machine. It can no longer, no foot is going to drive these things. It's bigger than the cottage. We've got to place them anywhere. And what they realize is there is a location which has harnessed water power before. And there's a, there, there are those sawmills and those grain mills. And th that's where they're first taken. So that's the original kind of factory? This is, uh, this is the 1780s, 1790s. Okay, then you're going to have a proliferation of new entities which have no history of working as mills that are going to be created along every, wherever there is flowing water. Okay. And by the way, this is basically, how, until we get steam power, which is in the 1840s, 50s, all of this is happening in the countryside because it's happening where there are flowing waterways, and particularly where there are waterfalls, where you have the power to kind of drive the water wheels that are going to be driving the gear systems and the leather belting systems to run these machines. Who is making these machines? Oh, you know, a cat, uh, you know there are, this is remarkable because this, this is a flurry of activity. You know, it's not like I, I can say, oh, there's an Edison here. It's a flurry of activity that's happening transatlantically here where there's no single person at work. But I'll, t I'll tell you a little where there are some single people at work here. So you can't, and, and there's a flurry of technological knowledge that's going on. The key firm here is the Arkwright firm that's really responsible for the, the, these. But there are other mechanic machine firms that are coming. And you're getting a whole machine trades coming out of this as well. Um, one last thing I want to say, by the way, which is new and really within the last 15 years, how we have globalized this story, and I think in very, very interesting ways. The story, as I used to tell in my original lectures, was a very um, internalist story into Great Britain. Uh, and this was the pressure that emerged for the merchants to, in the mercantile, mercantilist system to manufacture a product that could be sold in the colonies. Okay? And it was a, a British story, but unto the isle, and all of this undoings of the cottage system and the need to go into a factory system was there. We've shifted this remarkably, particularly has greater respect, as we're getting a greater global frameworks here, a greater respect to the manufacturing developments that have occurred in China and India prior to what is happening in England. In fact, the greatest producers of cloth at, at this moment in time, by far, nobody near, is, in, is the Indian cloth producers. And the Indian cloth is the most respected cloth. In fact, the, uh, what most Americans wear uh, throughout the 1700s is cloth that has been produced in India, Muslim and other kinds of cloth that is the East India Company is bringing here. So uh, both to London and to the colonies here. Particularly prized is the way the Indians know how to dye their cloth. In fact, blue, the, the Indian blue cloth is particularly treasured. And bolts of Indian blue cloth are actually the currency in the slave trade. When there's exchanges of British goods for slaves along the west coast of Africa, 
we all think there's pots and pans and guns and things like that. The chief, the, it's actually, it is, the bolt is the currency. It literally becomes a currency, a unit of currency is a bolt of cloth in exchange for a slave. But it ain't British cloth. It's Indian cloth. What happens, what we understand right now, is that it's not only a problematic of producing more cloth in England for the colonies, they want to outdo this new colony they have in England and reverse the system because the colonies are not supposed to be producing things. It's the homeland countries that are producing the manufactured goods. The colonies are the consumers of it and the providers of the raw materials. The Indians are upending what mercantilism is. We've got to stop them from producing and outproducing them. And one of the things that really we understand about these is they, they needed a technology to create a tightly woven cloth, which they were not able to do in the cotton system, to take the kinds of dyes that the Indians had perfected and which were treasured, the dyeing here. So there's been a new element of this which takes it out of this kind of internalist view of Great Britain and understands this as more of a global phenomenon. And that's my basic prima, how we have begun to think of industrialization quite differently than when I was learning this and teaching it as a, as a uh, social studies teacher here. So let me go on with my story here. I just want to say very quickly that the other thing, and this goes back to something I've said or other, is that we are very attentive these days to the unevenness and varied nature of industrialization. There's no single path. There are many paths. And so, for instance, in the United States, and now we'll come into the United States starting in the 1790s when this begins to unfold, but it will not unfold in a real rapid way until the 1820s, we have a very different kinds of paths of industrialization here, just here in the United States. There's the classic mill village, which proliferate into the 20th century, and the classic story here is Samuel Slater and the, the great Slater mill that's formed in, uh, built in 1790, considered the first uh, factory in the United States. Uh, this again, by the way, is a young uh, 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 guy who has served an apprenticeship in, uh, factor, in factory organization, by the way, in England, comes over here, works in a small shop in, uh, in New York, and then hears that there's a merchant in Providence, Rhode Island, Moses Brown, uh, who will be the founder of Brown University, who's uh, who is trying to create a factory system Use, uh, in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, uh, using the riverways there. And Slater hires himself, and they, they create this first mill. And these are uh, you know, small outfits, you know, usually maybe 30, 40 workers in them. But these mills just proliferate, spinning mills proliferate throughout, wherever there's a running creek or river. And we have the kind of mill village system here. I'm, I'm going to go quickly here. In the south, we actually have a, an industrialization system that emerges with the use of slave labor. So you have a, a path of industrialization through slavery, not necessarily wage labor. I can say a few words there, but I'm... Uh, Wait. Um, <laughs> Professor Lick, didn't Alfred Chandler say the first American managers were the slave plantation overseers? Yes, that goes to another story here. <laughs> But, uh, but it, it's interesting, by the way, uh, this, I, I could lec give a whole lecture on this. Then we have what becomes the classic story, and you all know the Lowell story. That's the one that gets ensconced in most history books, the Lowell story. It is highly exceptional. It is the exception. And the Europeans who come here are dazzled by it and say, oh, God, what the Americans have done. Lowell's exceptional, because most of the world is, uh, of the U.S. into the 1890s, even to the late 19th century, is filled with mill villages. We have industrial slavery. But here we have this extraordinary uh, 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 creation in Lowell, uh, which started by Francis Cabot Lowell. And this is an interesting uh, little story here. Francis Cabot Lowell is a member of an old family, of tr uh, a commercial family, who during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, as commerce has hit horribly in the United States, realized that these old Boston uh, merchant families are going to die off if they don't find some other outlet for their surplus capital. And he hears these tales of industrialization in Great Britain. He goes to Great Britain, does, uh, does some research, and comes back with this notion of creating an extraordinary industrial complex, first tried out in Waltham, Massachusetts, and then in Lowell, Massachusetts, 
And it is, and then there's the social t story of the great the Yankee Mill girls who come to work there. But this is an amazing story because it's unlike anything happening. This is where you're having uh, the use of corporately owned firms, which is just no one, uh, that sense of corporately owned firms manufacturers is unprecedented and will be for a long time. Where under all, uh, one roof, all, uh, all, factor, all aspects of production are going on from the cleaning, they will be using cotton. The cleaning of the cotton, the stretching of the cotton, uh, getting it ready for spinning. The spinning is going on, the weaving is going on, and the finishing all under one roof with all automated technologies, a uh, huge capital intensive production system with a huge investment of Lowell and his uh, Boston, uh, Boston Associates, commercial associates. Um, and that is the Lowell story. Most of the uh, of, uh, Europeans come and see this, and they're dazzled by American industrialization. Out of nowhere comes this full industrial complex, corporately owned, bureaucratically managed, uh, putting out a product. But boy, Lowell is an utter exception. The, the real, the mill villages proliferate. We have this industrial slavery. But then there is another kind of manufacturing system. Uh, which had they come to Philadelphia, they would have said, oh, this doesn't look so revolutionary. It's actually made it very complicated here. And that's what I want to get to. This is the, what I call the Philadelphia story. And yes, I'm using the words of the movie. <laughs> so what we have here is what I call a diversified specialized industrial system. Okay? And it is a flourishing and mushrooming of enterprise here. Now, I will say you have Tom Dorflinger probably was here yesterday and probably told you how Philadelphia emerges after the 1720s as the great commercial entrepot of the Western Hemisphere. It is second to London as in terms of its, uh, the amount of product that is being going back and forth in the port as well as the value of that product. But if, by 1810, 1815, uh, that has died, and this town is heading into, and you can read the papers at the time, it's like a, it's a ghost town is about to emerge here, and great worries that Philadelphia will go the way of the other commercial great ports of the colonial era, like Newport and Salem, and become a ghost town. Well, it doesn't become a ghost town. It has a reversal of history and becomes a manufacturing center, starting sort of, at, well, late 1810s, but really starting flourished in the 1820s. But it's a story where I can't point to a single industry like textiles, like Lowell, uh, a, a single group of entrepreneurs, a, a tiny group of entrepreneurs, uh, a single invention, a great inventor or something like that. This is just a mushrooming of activity that becomes very symbiotic to each other and grows and grows and grows. So, that's the story. I can give you the characteristics, but I can't give you many names. So, you know, I can give you names like Distant and stuff like that. But it is the diversity of the activity and the flourishing of it and the, the, the mushrooming of it and the symbiotic effects of it that I think you have to be appreciated here. So if I think about whoops, the structure, I'll give you some photographs. It is a, I don't call it a peculiar kind of industrial base because there are other places. Newark, New Jersey, I think, has these characteristics. Even New York a little. Uh, but it's a particular kind. Uh, it isn't the mill village. It certainly isn't that huge complex, the Lowell kinds of complexes. Uh, so here's the, the, the base, and then we'll go in, oops, the why this happens here. Uh, though I'm not sure we have uh, trouble. So the, the biggest thing I have to say is, is the utter diversity of production. Everything gets produced here. From cotton and silk cloth, hosiery, lace, hats, plain and tailored garments, shoes, tools, machines, saws, furniture, chemicals, drugs, jewelry, books, tiles, paints, and much, much more. Okay? It is a plethora of goods coming out of this town. High quality goods. Secondly, diversity in work settings. If you were to parachute into the city, let's say in 1855 or 1860, you'll see work going on in every imaginable setting in the home for direct home consumption or on the putting out basis, in craft shops, you know, the sort of Benjamin Franklin image of a craft shop that persists into the 20th century, tiny mills where there's still only hand labor, middle-sized mills where there's some hand labor but maybe a combination of steam uh, or water with the few places there's some 
uh, all the way up to what will be giant, what you could call plants, all happening at the same time. And the other thing that's happening is products can go through many different settings here on the way to becoming a, a filled products that we have um, separate establishments. So for instance, we don't have a Lowell system where all aspects of production go under one roof in the production of textiles and very fancy textiles. We will have, maybe in the home, somebody who works on carding. That is the cleaning of the fibers and the stretching of the fibers for twisting, who sells that to a twisting firm or spinning firm, who sells that spun thread to a weaver, who sells that to a bleacher, who sells it to a dyer, passing through many settings. We have a, sort of the separate establishments here, but each highly specialized, highly good in what they do because they're producing largely a customized good. And that gets to the other point here that we have specialization, both in products and processes, um, and uh, where we, we firms that are prospering in what we call, what I would call niche markets with very high quality goods rather than, our textile people, for instance, never, never, ever compete with Lowell. They put out some very, very fancy kinds of cloth here into niche markets and prosper in that. And finally, uh, this is not a corporate town at all. Even into the first decades of the 20th century, what we have here is a proliferation of small to medium-sized firms, uh, family-owned and managed, uh, sometimes partnerships, and tremendous reliance on skilled labor because you are producing custom goods which require skilled labor. All right, now that is a very particular kind of industrial structure. It does, it's not the mill village, it's not industrial slavery, uh, but it, it's here as well as those other kinds of systems of industrialization. And the question is, why do we get this here in Philadelphia, uh, that kind of structure? And there's no one answer here. I don't have a, a magic answer to this. There are many answers to it, and I'll just say quickly, this is a town unlike Lowell and unlike Patterson, New Jersey, where we do not have fast flowing rivers, uh, Google sometimes stops. Um, uh, there's no huge uh, falls uh, uh, where you have the Merrimack falling both into Lawrence and Lowell where you, uh, or the Passaic falling into Patterson. You just don't have that energy source initially to build these kind of launch structures. They try it out in Maniunk uh, to divert the river into, uh, to have it fall. There are certain energy deficits here, and that's, by the way, there will be a rapid adoption of steam power to a greater extent in this, in this city than other places. Because of those. But initially, it stops those large-scale complexes from emerging. Two, uh, we do have this skilled labor base, which goes back to colonial town times, because it's, it's such a center for artisanal production. And it, it, what we begin to get is this sort of Bring, when you get a, a, a young man like uh, of, um, uh, Distin who starts recruiting people out of Sheffield, you build that networks of bringing in more skilled labor and breeding, breeding more skilled labor. So we become a, a skilled labor town, we ha but, but it starts with that skilled labor base. And here I want to say that this doesn't, it's not happening in isolation. And we really have to respect here the importance of the diffusion of technical knowledge and expertise from Western Europe, particularly through immigration. Because when I, whenever I point to a good, a remarkable good that's being produced in the city, it is, begins with an immigrant worker who then brings in family and kin and other immigrant workers who have been some apprentice training in that trade somewhere else. And it's that diffusion and transfer of knowledge and expertise that's very critical. Uh, also importantly, they do profit, they prosper here, but not going into mass production, they're going into this small batch work of specialty goods into niche markets and prospering. Even our, the, the great, great steel mill here, we only have one great steel mill, Midvale Steel, never, ever, ever competes with Bethlehem and U.S. Steel. They put out a very specialty so-called gray steel, they do specialty castings, they do specialty forgings, things that U.S. Steel and Bethlehem and their mass production systems don't even want to touch. So even our large scale, Baldwin, the large, uh, Baldwin Locomotive Company, the largest producer here, uh, 1.17 thousand workers, never produced two engines that were the same, ever. Never produced two engines that were the same. He never didn't bother with all those people who were putting out a mass production 
uh, locomotive. Kill it! <laughs> kill it. <laughs> uh, can't kill it. Modern technology. <laughs> um, let me just quicken up here, because I can go over now, but I, I don't have that much more to say. Baldwin, the greatest locomotive producer in the world, uh, internationally, never produced two engines the same. They came, the, the carriers came with very special needs as to what product they were taking, the inclines, and he would work with them and his engineers to create a, a, a specific kind of engine. And then he had a complex of 23 buildings. In each building were highly skilled workers from the pattern makers, who created the pattern for the parts that had to be done, uh, to the molders who uh, produced those patterns, to the, tin the tinsmith workers, the copper workers, and all of these parts, specialty parts, would come to be assembled in these big, big shacks, like a, like a Rolls Royce is made today in some sense, not on a, an assembly line conveyor belt basis. So huge, but specialty production. Now, the last one I point to is the one which is kind of the most interesting here, because it's hard to nail down. There say, is something peculiar or particular about the investment behaviors of some of the wealthy people in this town, many who did, families who accumulated their wealth in colonial commerce, like the Boston New England groups, who became the investors in the Lowell's of the world. And we have a similar group who have this kind of surplus capital. But for some reason, and we don't quite understand, they do invest, but they tend to invest either in non-manufacture or things outside the city. So that investment goes into the creation of, this is the begins as an insurance capital of the country, into insurance business, into banking, mostly important though, into transportation infrastructure work, into the Pennsylvania Railroad, into the canal systems, and usually into the Pennsylvania anthracite region to, to get that uh, coal development. So they tend to invest in banking, finance, insurance, and huge infrastructure projects, not in local manufacture. And possibly, th because you're getting this plethora of these small immigrant-based specialty works, they didn't see where, where would a lot of money go into to build a big complex. And we don't have a big falls to run a big complex. So their money goes into this. And I think that's another reason you put that together. Some pictures here, and I'm almost done. Uh, this is the distant saw works. They make all sorts of saws, uh, this is circular saws, band saws, uh, all specialty made, industrial saws. Uh, the SS White Dental Instrument Company. <laughs> I love this. Uh, anybody have a great uncle or a great grandfather who was a dentist? Treasured the SS White Dental Instruments. They were the best in the world, won every industrial exposition. They were based still here, but they used women's labor. Uh, early lithograph of the Baldwin Locomotive Assembly Works. I, I, I'll just say, by the way, that this didn't happen randomly throughout the city. Uh, there, there are two great corridors of industry along the river and up in what's called Lower Germantown. This is where the decimation of the city is. This is your decimated regions of the city now with, through deindustrialization. Uh, in these districts since 1955, about 400,000 jobs have been lost. And these are devastated areas. The old industrial districts are devastated areas here. That's the story of deindustrialization. Last thing I just want to say, and then I'm just done, but I'll, tell, I'll look at this, is this peculiar, particular, rather, particular system of, of, of industrial enterprise, uh, which built up here, through this skilled immigrant labor, uh, uh, through uh, appreciation of craft, and where there was a market for craft go goods, which a, a family would buy for a lifetime and pass it through generations, um, had some implications for the social life of the city. For instance, we have a pretty particular kind of ethnic mix here. We have a disproportionate number of, in the 19th and early 20th century, of immigrants from Great Britain and Germany because that's where there was the craft traditions, that's where all the great apprenticeship journeyman programs were, and the German manufacturers who immigrated here recruited out of Germany, the British too. So of all the industrial cities, we have the largest percentages of British and um, 
uh, Germans. Uh, if you are an Irish worker here, you could find a job in a mill, but you'd probably wander more often into the Pennsylvania anthracite region or out to Pittsburgh to work in the big steel mills. So there's a very different kind of uh, ethnic makeup of this city than in other cities because of the premium on skill. There's actually, because there's a lot of light industrial work, there is a lot of opportunities, uh, like at Dental, the SS Dental White, for both child labor and women's labor. Of all the industrial cities, we actually have the largest percentage of women uh, in, in, in industry, but these are largely single women, not married women. Uh, and we also have the highest percentage of use of child labor in the city, too, because of some of the light industrial work that's there. I'd have to say, and I can't go on here, uh, as I and others have researched this, this is a world that is lily white. There is 100% discrimination of African American hire in any manufacturer in this city. I'll come back to that in questions. Uh, up until 1940, you cannot find a black person in any fa with one exception, in any factory in the city. The textile industry, in 1950, uh, 1940, we have the census that has uh, 45,000. Uh, workers, there are 35 African American workers. They're all janitors. What about this, Taylor? What? Taylor. Well, the Midvale Steel story I'll tell, where there are blacks. <laughs> but that's a very funny, I'll, I'll tell that uh, when, if we have that. This is a lily white world, an absolute lily white world. The reasons for that are, are complicated. I'd have to say that. I'd have to say also that this is a world of continuing conflict. Also, a lot of these skilled workers have a great sense of the value of their. Uh, the value of their hands and their abilities and the strategic place they have. So we do have rapid unionization here of, of, the, of, of the craft type. Uh, and they're very proud and they do go on and strike uh, even at the distant works. Um, so there's a lot of trade union activity connected with that. Final thing, because uh, my hour is just more than up, I just wanted to show you the de-industrial story which I have mentioned already. Uh, and again, is there are different paths to industrialization. As we see a world uh, in the United States that in the 20, last 25 years has just lopped off its manufacture, uh, there are different paths to deindustrialization. And Philadelphia has a particular path. It's not what you think of now, that cap the story of capital flight where my, a lot of industry is just taking off to low wage areas. This is a story about mass merchandising and shifts in consumer presence is the undoing of the Philadelphia's specialty production system. It starts as early as the 1920s with a place like Distant Saw, and then after, uh, there's a little, after World War II is just precipitous. Uh, so at its height, uh, we had 365,000, uh, about 360,000 manufacturing jobs. Uh, this is 2007. I saw this figure is now below 20 thousand manufacturing jobs. Uh, at its height, about 45% of all uh, uh, Philadelphians found their, uh, their working lives in the factories of the city. Good jobs, by the way, and really good paying jobs. Uh, where we'll be at, um, uh, this is Philadelphia, sorry. Wait, which is Philadelphia? <laughs> the blue. Uh, we'll be below, we're actually below 5% in the 2010 census. Of course, this is a phenomenon for all of the United States, um, where at our height we had uh, 19, in, in 1977, 19.4 million industrial jobs. We've lopped off about 5 million industrial jobs, where uh, percentage-wise, about 32, 33 percent of all Americans worked in industry. Uh, we're heading to the 5 percent, the 15 percent level or 12% level, I think, of that, uh, the manufacturing. The labels, the labels reversed at the end. I, I may have done something wrong here. But anyway, I have to fix this. So there's a, a, there's a all I will add here, and I can take some questions. I, Actually, I don't know uh, when your next session is. No, we have to, we'll have to break OK. It. I just want you to appreciate, as a, there are paths to industrialization, there are also paths to different paths to deindustrialization. Thank you very much.